Pastor Tim Lucas is about to change things up this morning at his church, a liquid church congregation in New York. He is putting money, well, he sees people put money in the collection plate every single week, even though he knows some of them are struggling financially. So this week, instead of collecting money in that collection plate, he is giving it away. We're talking about $30,000 here, and Pastor Lucas joins me now. Sir, thank you uh, for being here. And let, let's go on that point I just made. Um, even though you know some people in your congregation are struggling, you see them every Sunday doing whatever they can to give to the church? That's correct. Our typical Sunday, people give about $30,000 in cash into our Sunday offering. Wow. And so today, we're going to do just the opposite. They're going to reach in and pull out an unmarked envelope that we have prepacked with 10s, 20s, and 50s. Okay. Where does this money, did you just pull this out of the church funds, the 30000 that's correct. We took the previous week's offering and we're going to give it back out in the middle of our service today. What is the reaction you've gotten in church to this? I think people are acting like they're going to be struck by lightning. <laughs> <laughs> they're typically, uh, you know, a lot of people are cynical about religion and they come to church expecting to be shaken down. But we're saying, you know what? It's really all God's money and he trusts you. You know, every bill in the uh, U.S. economy says, in God we trust, and we're going to put that to the test. Now, do you think there are some people who are reluctant and are just not comfortable taking money, frankly, out of the collection plate for one, but also taking from the church or even admitting that they need some help right now? Well, we're challenging people to creatively invest it in one of three ways. So maybe it's a single mom who receives a $50 bill and she's going to use that to fill her tank with gas this week or pay for a babysitter. So people are free to take it. But we're challenging most people to actually look and help a neighbor in need. Here in New Jersey, a lot of people were hurt by floodwaters of Hurricane Irene. So yeah. maybe they're going to go to the, buy groceries and cook a meal and bring it over to a hurting neighbor. Huh. Others are going to, we're asking them to actually multiply it and invest it over the next three weeks, bring it back, and we're going to donate it to help rebuild a homeless shelter. Okay, and just one envelope you're telling them to take, right? That's right, one envelope, <laughs> but uh, again, you know, that's between them and God. <laughs> <laughs> now, is this, and this is not the first we've heard of something like that. Actually, you all, is this the first time you've done it? This is the first time we've ever done something like this, and candidly, is a little bit of a risk. We're not a rich church. We don't own a building. We don't hold a mortgage, but we're trying to teach our people to be rich in good deeds. Okay, do you think this is what more, because you just made a point. Some people look down on religion. They believe in God, and they have their own spirituality, but they just frown on religion sometimes. But this, do you think this is more of the role of the church to be helping community in this way? I'm not asking you to criticize other churches who maybe don't do this, but... Is this more of what churches should be doing? Yeah, I think the church is supposed to be the organization that exists for its non-members. It's not a country club. It's not a gated community where it exists to serve the members. But we exist to serve our non-members. That is our neighbors in need, the communities. I think when people hear the name of our church, Liquid, they assume we're a cult or a drinking fraternity. <laughs> and uh, we named it Liquid for one reason. Jesus calls himself the living water, and we think church should be refreshing. All right, last thing, do you expect those pews to be a little more filled than previous uh, Sundays? I assume some people in the community who haven't come to your church might just show up today. Is that okay with you? Everybody in attendance is welcome at Liquid. Um, this is not a bribe for people to come to church. It's not going to be a bailout. I mean, let's be realistic, $20 is not going to change somebody's life. But people may come, you know, hoping to find a bailout. We hope they find something better. We hope they find God. All right, Pastor Lucas, we will follow up. Like you said, it's kind of a risk. You're not a risk, rich, uh, rich church, so I uh, hope it works out for you all. But uh, thank you for spending the time with us, certainly on a busy Sunday for you all, and good luck today. Thanks so much, TJ. God bless. All right, who's excited for today's offering? You guys ready? We're going to have some fun. Hey, welcome to Liquid. Uh, my name is Tim. That was eight years and 15 pounds ago. Uh, but we were only four years old as a church. Uh, we had enough money to survive three months, but we said, you know what? We want our calling card. We want to be known as a church that is known for its radical generosity. Amen? We want to be the kind of church that if, even if, we, were, if we closed our doors, our communities, even the non-believers would say, man, that's a tragedy because they bless our socks off. So we're glad that you're here today, and we are giving away today's Sunday offering, not to you specifically this time, but we are giving out to some special neighbors in need outside of our church walls who could use our help. 
So we, wanted to, we just wanted to like rewind the tape uh, eight years and just remember uh, kind of where that was injected into us. It was 2011, and that was our first ever reverse offering. And as I said, we couldn't really afford it at the time, but I mean, you know, man, God's church doesn't run on dollars and cents. It's about following the Holy Spirit, trusting that God can do more than we ask or imagine. So I was supposed to preach on Matthew chapter 25, which is this parable known as the parable of the talents. And in the story Jesus tells, he says uh, uh, this master's going away, and it says he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, one bag of silver to the last. In other words, he divided it in proportion to their abilities. And so we were like, you know what? We want to really, we don't want to just read God's word. We want to do God's word. And so someone said, I got an idea. What if we give away God's money? And we're like, what? Uh, to God's people. And it was like, that's crazy. And I was like, I love it. Uh, because every bill in our currency says, in God we trust. But have you ever thought about it? That every time that you get a paycheck, God trusts you. In other words, everything we have, every paycheck, every dollar, God says, it's all, it's all from my hand, but I'm going to give it to you. And here's the deal. I want you to multiply it. And I want you to advance my kingdom on earth until I return. That's who the master is. Jesus is away. He says, I'm going to give you my wealth. And when I return, I want to see a spiritual harvest. And so that morning, we stuffed offering envelopes, not with fives, twos, and ones, but fifties, twenties, and tens. And uh, when it came around, we just said, just reach in and take an offering envelope out. And people literally looked like they were like, oh, they're going to get struck by lightning. But what we said is, now, now just invest it and, and build God's kingdom. Because the guy who got five talents in Jesus' story he multiplied it into 10. The guy who got two multiplied it to four. And here's what Jesus said. The master was full of praise. He said, let's read it together, church. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now, how many of you know any wealth we have comes from God alone, right? 100% of it is his, okay? You may be new to church, you're like, I don't know, I think I earned it. Who gave you those talents? <laughs> who gave you those ability? Uh, who gave you that intellect? Any paycheck in your pocket, any money we make, wealth that we manage, 100%, the Bible says, is a gift from the hand of your Father in heaven. But he says, I want you to be my money manager. I want you to take it and invest and multiply because I trust you. And so we took the biggest risk of our life as a church. Uh, I will never forget what happened. A single mom actually did uh, reach in. I think she got a $50 bill, and she came to me after service. She said, Tim, I wasn't going to come to church today because I didn't have enough gas. She said, I've been trying to save enough gas. I'd have enough just to get to work and drop my kids off this week. And when I got this, and then she just started crying. She goes, I felt like God was winking at me, like saying, I see you. I'm going to provide for your needs. There was another family of four who said, you know, we live next to a, a senior citizen as a woman who was actually sick, shut in. She didn't really go out much. And so that family of four, they pooled their money, a 10, a 20, you know, a 50, put together, and they bought groceries, and they made a four-course meal, and they brought it over to her, spent the afternoon just eating and visiting with her, so they gave her their time. I was blown away by the creativity that people came up with to bless their neighbors. At one campus, the owner of a hair salon, this is so fun, he used his $50 bill to give free haircuts to the homeless. Take a look at this. The stylists in the salon were like so inspired by his generosity, they donated their services, and for an entire weekend, they cut hair, they trimmed the beards, they gave free salon services to three dozen homeless people in their city. <laughs> love it. That's God's people. But the most creative one, I love this, was a pair of young stay-at-home moms at the time, Lauren and Gail. They actually met in a liquid small group, and they have this passion for baking. They like to make those fancy cakes like you see on Cake Boss. You know, those like fancy like wedding kind of, you know, cakes things and stuff. And so they made a masterpiece, and they posted a picture of their cake on, on Facebook. And they said, hey, we're going to auction it off and give 100% to a battered women's shelter. We want to help remodel this, this, uh, this women's shelter. And it was amazing because it kind of went viral. It was all of a sudden, you know, it cost them 50 bucks to make, but then it was $100, then 200, 300, 400, over $500 that they donated. They helped remodel a, a, a women's uh, house for victims of domestic violence, you know? Awesome. So to me, it was just kind of amazing. It's so inspiring to see like generosity go viral, right? This little trickle turned into this river of generosity. Now that was eight years ago, guys. And we didn't have, again, have enough money to survive three months. But we learned a profound lesson that has guided our church ever since, and that's this. No matter how much you give, you can never outgive 
God. Amen? You can never can. And so today, I want to talk about our value of inspiring generosity. What we're talking about is these six Holy Spirit-inspired habits that we've seen God bless in our church. We started with L, stands for love the overlooked, our passion for special needs. Uh, I, igniting the imagination. Q, quenching their thirsty, our clean water cause. Many are running next week. Unite the generations. And then today, I, inspire generosity. So if you open up to page 39 in your group's guides, you'll see we're doing something similar today. It says this, at Liquid, we truly believe the words of Jesus. It's more blessed to give than to receive. That's why we're giving away our offering today. Seriously. <laughs> we're using this Sunday's offering in a special way to help families in need outside our church walls. Thanks for giving. Your generosity is meeting practical needs and pointing people to Jesus. Um, what I found is it's very true. In a post-Christian culture where most people are skeptical of organized religion, they're suspicious, outright cynical. When they see Christians sacrificially giving out of their time their treasure, sacrificing your talents to help people in need, it earns a fresh hearing for their gospel. The reason why we're generous is not that we're a good church, we're God's church, and we want to imitate our daddy God. This is what it says, the center of our faith, right? For God so loved the world that he what? Gave. So how does God express his love? By giving his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So when we receive communion, we're recognizing everything we have is from God, including eternal life, our salvation. So by definition, here's the deal. If you call yourself a Christ follower, by definition, you are a giver. Christ gives his life for yours, and he says, I want you to give your life away for others. So Christians are supposed to be the most generous people on the planet. My question is, what happened? Because <laughs> a lot of Christians are known for being stingy or cheap, and in my mind, a stingy Christian should be an extinct species. You can tweet that. <laughs> One of my favorite verses in the Bible is Proverbs 11, which says this. The wor Let's read this together. The world of the generous gets larger and larger, while the world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. What's God saying? He's saying that when you're generous, it not only enlarges your heart, it enlarges your perspective, it actually enlarges your world. By the way, Gail and Lauren, the two stay-at-home moms who baked that cake to help battered women, they went on to start a business called a Sweet Passion Cakery, and they were chosen by the Food Network to appear on their reality show, Winner Cakes All. They won the contest. Their business has blown up, and they can't keep up with the demand. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> the world of the generous gets larger and larger. You want a broader life? You want a bigger impact? Open your hands so God can open his arms. So I want to talk to you today about this, this river of inspire generosity. And um, God's not just talking about money here, just to put everyone at ease. Because like if you're visiting, you're like, oh, this is why I don't go to church. They're after your money. This is not just about money. Generosity, understand, is a lifestyle. God wants followers of Jesus to be generous with our time, generous with our praise, generous with our love, generous with forgiveness, generous with paying attention to the needs of other people. So generosity is a lot more than about like donating your time or money. It's about living a life where you're a giver, not a taker. And so that's what I want to help do today at our campus is inspire generosity. So before I reveal where we're giving away today's offering, I want to show you what a spirit of biblical generosity looks like in 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. So you can open your Bible, or, or some of you have a phone, so just take your phone out. You can flip there, uh, 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. This is the Bible's uh, most descriptive passage about what supernatural generosity looks like in action. Now, let me give you a little background, like when you hear like 2 Corinthians. This is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul to a church in Corinth. That was ancient Greece. That's why it's called Corinthians, okay? So it was a letter written, if it was like written to our church, it would be called Second New Jerseyans, okay? And in this letter, Apostle Paul is going to describe how the early Christians in the church of Jerusalem were suffering. They were actually quite poor. And the church was under a lot of pressure and stress. They were being persecuted. Things were financially tight. And so Paul said to the other churches, he says, hey, these guys are hurting. So let's receive a special offering to help them. Let's give generously to relieve the stress they're under. So all these churches in Macedonia, they stepped up and said, oh, absolutely, man. We have a heart to help. We'll, we'll, give, we'll give generously. 
And so here, Paul, as you're about to read, he's writing this church in Corinth, and he says, hey, how about you guys? You guys got a heart to help? What, what, what are you going to give to help your hurting brothers and sisters? And so he points to these churches of Macedonia as an example of what true generosity looks like. Here's what he says in verse 1 and 2. He says, and now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace. Everyone say grace. grace. It means gift. I want you to know about the spiritual gift that God has given the Macedonian churches. And then he describes it. In the midst of a very severe trial, their what? Their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in what? Rich generosity. So see the overflowing joy, rich generosity. Paul's making a connection. And if you're taking notes, here's the first true quality of biblical generosity. It is enjoyable. Christians are told to give out of joy, not out of guilt, not out of duty, not out of obligation. Oh, I got to put a tip in the offering bucket. We give actually out of sheer joy. Generosity is enjoyable. It says in the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy just kind of spilled out of them, welled up in rich generosity. But notice it says they're in the middle of their extreme poverty. In other words, this wasn't a rich church. It had nothing to do with their circumstances. They were extremely poor. In fact, you know what was happening? It says they were going on a severe test. You know what that was? Persecution. Like Christians in Syria who were being killed by ISIS, they were being slaughtered. They were losing their lives. 2 Corinthians is written during the Roman period when Nero was on the throne. So if you were a Christian and you were caught, you were either fed to the lions for sport or you're dipped in tar and pitch and set on fire to light the gardens of Caesar. So you understand? In that culture, if you're a Christian, a follower of Jesus, you died. So these Christians are poor and they're persecuted, but watch, it doesn't stop them from giving. It says their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. They gave out of joy. Now guys, unbelievers don't get this. You may be here today and you're like, I'm not a Christian. I understand why that sounds crazy to you. You will never truly understand this until you ask Jesus Christ into your life. It's until you have that communion moment where you realize God gave his son to cancel my debt. I got nothing on me anymore. And so now my whole life I'm giving back to God. You will not understand it. When people see you giving out of what little you have, to someone you don't even know, in our culture, they're like, that's cray cray. <laughs> that's crazy town. But in the kingdom, it's commonplace. Generosity is just a natural byproduct of joyful living. Let me ask you this. Have you ever noticed the happiest people in the world are givers, yeah? They're not takers, right? Think about the people in your life who you love being around. The most miserable people in the world <laughs> are people who are just takers, right? I mean, even that word miserable and the word miser come from the same word. <laughs> because when you're miserly or you're stingy, you're just a miserable person. But the Bible says actually a spirit of generosity is enjoyable. It's one of the most fun things you can do. Give open-handedly to God and then watch him multiply it and change the world. So give me an example. Next Saturday, some of you are being generous with your time. You are coming here. You're going to run for Rwanda. You're going to get up early. You're going to come to Parsippany. You're going to give a couple hours your morning. You're going to jog. I'm going to power walk, kind of, you know, or stroll. And what we're doing is we're giving 100% of this outreach um, to provide clean drinking water for the poorest people on the planet, our brothers and sisters in Rwanda who are recovering from genocide. But here's something inspiring. One of the families in our congregation was so inspired by this mission, the dad said, uh, Pastor Tim, I own a business. And God's just blessed me. He's just enabled me to be successful. Our family, I don't know why he chose us, but we've just been successful. But here's the deal. I want a spiritual prophet. <laughs> he said, I want my success to have significance. He said, so I give generously. I tithe. But I love this idea of giving the poorest people on the planet clean drinking water. And so I want to double every donation next Saturday to the run for Rwanda. Can we thank God for that generosity? That's incredible. I was like, it's like, bro, I can't thank you enough. You know, he said, he said, are you kidding me? He said, it's a joy to do. It's a joy. Guys, you're sitting next to some of the most generous people on the planet. 
So far in our 12 years, the people you're sitting next to have now donated over $3.3 million to bring clean water to 100,000 people. That's incredible. So understand, it's like, the, like in the Bible here, the, like the Macedonians. Your generosity is literally helping poor Christians on the other side of the world receive the living water. And it's a joy to do. Generosity is a joy. But secondly, and Paul says, understand, it's not human. It is supernatural. That's what we see here in verse 3. Paul's talking about this poor church who gives to help another. And he says, for I testify. I'm telling you. I'm telling the truth. He says, they gave as much as they were able, and watch this, even what? Beyond their ability. How do you give beyond your natural ability? It's called supernatural giving. In other words, natural giving is like, I'm going to keep all this for me, and maybe I give a little bit over here. <laughs> I'll, I'll give what I'm able, or I give what I can afford. But supernatural giving is when God whispers in your ear, and you're like, I'm actually going to give beyond my natural ability. Now understand, there are many of you who do that every week, through your tithes, through your offerings. Like when we receive offering, what you're saying is, I'm going to take money that you could have used for a legitimate purpose, to pay a bill, to uh, make a car payment, to you know, uh, buy clothes, whatever it was. You took money that you could have used, that you needed, and you're like, I'm going to use it for something else. I'm going to use it to feed the poor. I'm going to use it to clothe the homeless. I'm going to use it to serve families with special needs. Understand, that is not the natural way of things. <laughs> that is super natural. Do you know what's natural? It's natural for me to hoard. <laughs> it's natural for me to keep every little thing for me, my precious. <laughs> it's natural for me to be golem, my precious. It's natural for me to worry and wring my hands. What about the trade war? What about a possible recession? What about, that's what's natural. It's supernatural when you give beyond your ability. It's, what it means is it is the Holy Spirit that inspires you, whispers, trust me. Trust me enough to open your hands and give away some of what your Father's given to you to bless others. I had a cool phone call this week with a single mom who she had given this um, just extraordinarily generous financial gift this fall. And I was, I, when I heard about it, I was a little taken aback, honestly, because I was like, single parent, she's living in New Jersey, you know how hard that is, raising kids, the whole thing. And so I called her, I said, you know, beyond just, thank you, I said, I just always love to know, like, what exactly did the Holy Spirit whisper to you <laughs> that, like, inspired such a significant gift? And she said, well, Tim, actually, it's, um, I had a relationship that didn't work out, that's why, you know, I'm single now, but I moved to New Jersey, I actually had to sell my previous house. But you gotta understand, Tim, I believe everything I have is God's. And so when the house sold, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me, you need to tithe on the sale. Now tithing, that just means you give the first 10% of anything you receive back to God. It's a way of putting God first in your finances, right? I was like, you tithe on the sale of your house? in New Jersey? <laughs> Guys, that's supernatural. And she said to me, she goes, well, it's actually not that hard. I just find in my experience, the more I give, the more God blesses. In other words, that's what happens when you give beyond your natural ability. When you open your hands, God opens his arms. Paul writes this in chapter 9. He says, remember this. Look what he says. Here's the principle. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap what? Generously. So he's talking about like scattering seed like a farmer. I mean, if you, if you, you garden, you know this. If you, put in, if you plant a single tomato seed, how many tomatoes do you get back? What? No, you, you've never planted anything, bro. <laughs> it's a trick question. You, you know, yeah? You put in a single tomato seed, what happens? You get a whole vine of tomatoes, right? You, let's try it again. You take a single apple seed, you put the single apple seed in the ground, how many apples do you get? A whole tree, a bushel of apples. The point is, when you open your hands, God multiplies what you give him. Paul says, he who sows generously will reap generously. In other words, God says, you choose how much you want to bless, get me to bless your life. Like, actually, it depends on your, if you sow a little bit, you're going to get a little bit. 
You sow more, you get more. God says, I, I have the power to multiply this, but it's totally up to you. The more you open your hands to help others in my name, God says, the more I trust you. It's not about giving to get. I'm going to bless you and go to grow your faith supernaturally because you have to share my heart. So understand that spirit generosity is supernatural. And notice, biblical generosity is totally voluntary. Just to take the pressure off. I'm letting you off the hook. You don't even have to give a cent today. You will not change God's love for you. You don't have to give a dime. In fact, if it's your first time and you're like, ah, oh, I knew it. I bet that guy's like a private jet or something like that. You know, like <laughs> televangelist kind of thing behind the scenes. Just like forget it. God's not, we, we don't want you. God doesn't need your money. How many of you know that? He doesn't need it. But you need to give to break the grip of materialism on your heart. Because we live in Oz. So understand, whenever we give at church, it's not out of guilt. It's not out of duty. It's not obligation or pressure. There is no pressure ever to give. In verse 4, Paul says this, and this is a crazy verse. This is crazy. He says, here's this poor church. Of their own free will, they what? Begged us. And they pleaded for the privilege of having a part in helping God's people. They begged us. They pleaded for the privilege of helping. Paul's like, basically, they came up to me like, please, pastor, please. How, we, I'm begging you, give us another chance. Please pass the offering plate a second time. Would you take a second offering? Said no one ever. Okay. <laughs> How many of you know, this is very hard for non-Christians to understand. Maybe you, I grew up going to church when the offering plate came around. I thought, oh, this is like a restaurant. This is where you put a tip in. Yeah? I like the music. You get three bucks today. <laughs> they played my favorite song, 350, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> You're like, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't like that whole little thing, though. I'm going to take some out. You know, it just depends where you are in New Jersey, right? <laughs> People on the outside, when they look inside the church like this, they say, well, I understand why people give. They're forced to give. They're pressured. The pastor, the priest tells them, they got to give or God's going to be mad at them. Guys, have you ever noticed? We never, ever, never, ever play the guilt card at Liquid. I talk about this in the book. We never, ever, ever pressure people, and we never will. You know why? Because it's worthless in God's eyes. God is not interested in guilt offerings. Manipulation taints generosity. It, you might as well just keep it because the only generosity God says matters to me comes out of the heart and it's 100% voluntary. It comes out of the joy of realizing, oh my gosh, God's blessed me and now he's positioning me to be a blessing to others. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, here's what Paul says. Favorite verse. Each of you should give exactly this amount. Doesn't say that. <laughs> Each of you should give what you have decided where? In your heart to give. So it's not just doing the math on a calculator. Add your heart to give. Not reluctantly or under compulsion, like you're pressured, because here's the kind of giver God loves. God loves a? Let's say the word cheerful with a true cheer. God loves a? Cheerful giver! We love to give! Guys, in 12 years of leading this church, we have never pressured or guilted anybody into giving a cent. And here's why. Because we trust God 110%. God has supplied every need of this church. We, we, like if we just close shop today, it's like incredible what he's done. But understand, we trust God and we trust you. We actually trust the Holy Spirit to provide what we need. And what I've found is whenever we have an opportunity to bless others outside our church walls, we trust the Holy Spirit will speak to your heart because you're the church. We're the church together, right? It's not the building. We're the people, the body. And so the Holy Spirit lives in us. And so I think today the Holy Spirit's going to inspire us together to do something pretty cool. And so before we receive today's offering, let me tell you about our opportunity to help our neighbors in need. Um, over the last year, we pretty much kind of, you know, we plan, but we pray pretty much about most major decisions in the future. We say, you know, before we start making plans, let's just commit it to prayer. And we've been praying about how we as a church can be a blessing to the cities where we're privileged to have a liquid campus. Uh, we now have seven congregations in seven cities. And so we just have a heart to serve the families there, especially ones who are struggling to make ends meet, kind of living paycheck to paycheck. In fact, we actually tell our campus pastors, we want you to go meet with the mayor or the town officials 
And they typically go in there, and I've had several of these meetings with the mayors, and you know, we, after we introduce ourselves, they're like, oh yeah, we've heard about liquid, da, da, da. And we said, Mr. Mayor, it's just our, from my heart, just hear me, is there a group in this city who need our help? Is there somebody who you would like to see served, but you don't have the budget for it? And you know what they typically say? Get out. <laughs> they, they're like, I, I don't believe you. They, they don't say that, but they, they're, they're like, wait, why? <laughs> Because they're cynical. They're like, separation of church and state, you're gonna try to convert people, you got some religious program. And we're like, no, no. <laughs> we're like, there's no catch. And they're like, this is like no strings attached. And so we always tell them, we said, there's literally no catch. We're here because God so loved the world that he gave his son. So Jesus has said to us, freely we've received, now freely we give, no strings attached. And so this past year, we became aware of a growing problem for many New Jersey families in the cities where we have campuses. More and more, low-income families are having problems paying for school lunch for the kids. In fact, what we discovered is that kids in school districts who can't afford to pay for school lunch are receiving more and more of a stigma. In other words, you go through the line, and because your parents can't afford lunch, they say, whoop, and they stamp your hand and make you sit at a different table. In some districts, if you have school lunch debt, meaning your parents couldn't pay for lunch, you don't get to play sports. Some districts in New Jersey, they actually hold back your diploma. Can you imagine? This is happening all across the nation. It's very underreported. And as CBS News reports, it is a growing epidemic in New Jersey schools. Tonight that they're really there really is no such thing as a free lunch. One local school district is threatening to report parents to the state if they don't pay for their kids' lunches. CBS 2's Valerie Castro tells us about the cafeteria controversy. We're just contacting parents to say, hey, can you just pay the bill? That question seems simple enough, but the Englewood School District in New Jersey says not enough parents are paying up when it comes to school lunches. Now the district has come up with this solution. The last resort would be to call uh, the state and, and Child Protective Services and say, hey, this is some type of, you're, you're hurting your child. You know, you're not taking care of your child. That's a responsibility. Students are never denied a meal at school if they don't have the cash, but it's adding up. The school district says an audit revealed $100,000 in unpaid food. School lunch costs $2.50. Divide that up, and that's 40,000 unpaid meals. How did that get so out of control? There are no systems in place here. You know, we, this is as a new superintendent, we have a new business administrator. We are doing a lot of changes to put systems in place so that things work much more efficiently. The district says the new policy first calls for letters to be sent home to parents. That's followed up by phone calls, face to face meetings, and finally that call to the state. And it's taxpayer money. We want to make sure we're being paid. Some parents say the new measures are too tough. You think it's too extreme? That's way extreme. Child Protective Services? <laughs> that ain't good. Others understand the concern. We're not perfect people. Parents have a lot on their plate. But if this is something that's constantly happening with the same adult, same parent, same child, then that's something that Child Protective Services needs to get involved in. The district plans to implement the new policy this fall. In Inglewood, New Jersey, Valerie Castro, CBS 2 News. You guys remember getting lunch in middle school? How awkward that was? You like kind of go through the line. And you're looking at the girls over there. Maybe that was just me. <laughs> and you're like, I want some tater tots, and I'll have tater tots. And you have tater tots. And imagine you're going through with your friends. And now, of course, I, it's being middle school. You're thinking there's bullying, there's social media, mass shootings, all this stuff. And you're going through lunch line with your friends. And they're like, you get lasagna, you get lasagna, you, oh. Your parents can't pay for it. You get white bread with sun butter and jelly. And you're not actually allowed to play basketball this fall. You can sit over here at this table. Imagine in middle school that stigma being attached to you. What we found is that 75% of school districts across the nation have families that are carrying student meal debt. And so we said, let's not debate the politics of it. In here in New Jersey, they give free lunch if you can't actually, uh, if you qualify, but the qualifying floor is $32,000 for a family of four. So if you're earning $32,000, you should be able to raise a family of four and pay for lunch yourself. You try that one? And so we said, let's not debate the politics of it. 
Let's just be the body of Christ and feed kids, amen? Let's get them lunch. And so we just said, we contacted the Board of Eds where we have campuses in the town, and we just said, hey, could we, could we as a church just bless the families in our town and pay off their debt for the 2019-20 school year? And they're like, no way. We're like, way. <laughs> We're gonna be totally professional, but we don't need to know their names. We realize it's a sensitive issue, keep it anonymous. We just have a heart to help. So our church wants to make a one-time donation, just cancel the debt of all the families in the town so their kids can have lunch. And so, well, this is the fun part. We're like, just keep it anonymous. And if, if, keep it anonymous. And if they ask, just let them know. When their bill comes and it says paid in full, you can just tell them it was Jesus who wiped their debt clean. So, church, I'm excited to announce we are donating 100% of this morning's offering to cancel the school lunch debt of 1,473 families in our schools and cities. We are excited about this one. This is gonna be a, yeah, buddy, enjoy. <laughs> this represents over 3,000 children and students. And again, this is, to me, this is our church at its best. This is why Jesus founded the church. And it's straight from the Bible, guys. We're just putting into practice what it says in Proverbs 22. It says, the generous will themselves be blessed, for they do what? They share their food with the poor. So this is just a practical way to show the love of God and saturate our cities with Christ's compassion and make an impact. And let me tell you, it's already having an impact. We haven't even read the checks yet. Let me just be, share something cool. This is from one of the districts. The superintendent of schools sent us an email. Here's what he wrote. He said, oh my goodness, are you sure? <laughs> This would be an incredible blessing to our district and so many children and their families. First, listen to his language. This will truly be a gift from heaven for the students impacted, many of which can only serve, we can only serve a basic cold lunch, meaning the Bureau of Child Nutrition Standards, blah, 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 and according with Board of Ed policy. Furthermore, since students who owe money cannot participate in major extracurricular events like proms, and cannot receive their diplomas unless all their student debts and fines are paid, this will serve as a tremendous relief for them and their families. Thank you so very much, and please extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to your entire congregation. May God bless you all. So much for separation of church and state, man. That's just, <laughs> it's an awesome thing to be able to do. It, see, it turns out that this kind of no strings attached grace, generosity, is a powerful witness for Christ. We have found it actually softens the heart of the most hardened skeptics. New Jersey and the Northeast is full of them. Oh, it's religion, and there, da, 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 da. Understand, this is not a new church strategy. This is as old as the New Testament. Can I show you the last thing cool here? God showed this to me this week in Acts chapter 2. When the early church first started, in other words, when Jesus was resurrected, he said, all right, now I'm sending you out into all the world. I'm going back to heaven. I want you to invest your lives reaching people for me. Here's what it says the early church did. Watch this sequence of verses. It says the early Christians, they sold property and possessions to give to who? Anyone who had need. In other words, they took their possessions and they said, we're going to wipe out poverty. In other words, evidently, according to God's word, the church started with good deeds. Now watch the result. What happened? Next verse. It said, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, praising God, worshiping, and what? Enjoying the favor of who? All the people. Just the Christians? Uh-uh. All the people. Evidently, their good deeds earned goodwill in the community. You following? Now, what happens once you have the favor of the community? It says, next verse, and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Evidently, good deeds led to goodwill, which earned a fresh hearing for the good news. You understand? That's how you reach spiritually thirsty people in a post-Christian culture, guys, because the world watches and they take notice because they're like, who does this? Who, who does this? 
Whether they believe in Jesus or not, they can't help but praise God. So don't miss the sequence in Scripture. Good deeds earns goodwill, which results in the good news being shared. So generosity isn't just for the receiver or the giver. It's a powerful, powerful witness for people who don't know Christ yet. You know, I often meet with other pastors in our region, New York, Long Island, who want to, you know, grow their churches or saturate their city for Christ. And the main question I ask them is this. I say, okay, be totally honest. If your church closed its doors tomorrow, would anyone in the community care? I'm not talking about Christians. Would any non-believers care? Because I like to think that our church is such a blessing in the communities where we're privileged to have a campus that even non-Christians are like, I don't agree with them, but man, they bless our socks off. Thank God liquid is there because they're the church, not with the rock and worship, not with the interesting preaching. They're the church that blesses the socks off our city. I want atheists to say, I don't, I don't even believe what they do, but man, I'm so glad they're here. What would we do without that church? We want to be so vital to the cities that if we closed our doors, the entire neighborhood would be upset. Guys, this understand is how the gospel spreads in a post-Christian culture. I really feel like we need a new reformation. You know, the first reformation was about creeds. I think the second reformation needs to be about deeds. The, the first reformation was about debating doctrine. Guys, we need to stop debating the Bible and start doing the Bible in practical ways. No kid should go hungry. No, no kid should be shamed because their parents can't pay for lunch. Kids are already stressed on every side, so we're like, you know what? We just want the people of God flowing in the power of God to saturate our city with the generosity of God. Say amen if you agree with that. Amen. We're going to do it. We're going to cheer. we got an amazing opportunity right now. And so in a few minutes, I'm going to call forward our ushers at every campus to receive today's offering. And again, we're just giving it away today. And uh, in your program today is an offering envelope. If you want to take out that envelope, I want to call your attention to something. First off, notice it's, it's always postage paid, but, but I want you to see the verse that we print in here so that you understand this is not pressure, okay? It's literally from Scripture. We wrote 2 Corinthians 9, 7. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives what? So you can make a difference today by putting your tithe in here. Now, tithing, that's, that represents, again, that's a biblical concept if you're new. It represents giving 10% of your income back to God's house. That's the starting point for Christian generosity. God's word actually says the purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. So if you've held back your tithe for a while, or you realize, man, I need to start tithing, this is a great place to start. And I just wanna thank each and every one of you who does that. You are sitting next to thousands of families who tithe every week, and it's foundational. In fact, here's kind of a cool story. I was talking with this uh, newlywed couple, just a couple of 20-somethings who just got married, and they said, Tim, we actually decided to tithe our wedding gifts. 20-somethings. They said, we're, we're trying to save to buy a house, but we want to start a marriage off right, and we're going to put God first, and so we want to give 10% of our wedding gifts. Guys, that maturity, like I was blown away by that generosity. Let me ask you, do you think God will honor that? You better believe it. What a great foundation for a marriage. To me, that kind of faith and maturity in that young couple is so inspiring. So giving a tithe is the first way to help. But the second way you might be able to help today is by giving a special offering. An offering by definition, there it is, is above and beyond your tithe. That's why it's an offering. I'm offering this to God. So you may be like, you know what, Tim? I, I just, someone, someone after the first service, they said, Tim, I, was, I got free lunch growing up. I lived in Patterson, and I, I remember what that was like. I remember my mom weeping because I, she didn't have money to pay $800 for me and my brother and my sister. And so you're like, you know what? I have a heart. I want to help with these school lunch meals. Maybe God's blessed you, and you're like, man, I want to bless somebody else. That's a beautiful thing. I was actually talking with a guy who, uh, who walks, works on Wall Street, and uh, the other week I said, hey, how's it, you know, how's it going this year? And he says to me, he's like, well, Tim, it's actually funny. Business is better than expected. I mean, it's, in fact, all the ups and downs of the market and trade wars and all that stuff. He said, we turned a profit. Uh, and my boss said, this fall, my bonus is going to be bigger than usual. And I was like, dude, praise God. That's awesome, man. 
And then he says, and so I'm writing a check to the church. I said, really? He said, yeah, I just figure God must have somebody special in mind that he wants to help. That caught me off guard. <laughs> First off, most Wall Street folks, <laughs> most New Jersey folks, let's be honest, all of us, <laughs> don't typically interpret a bonus as a sign of like, well, I guess God wants to help somebody, <laughs> right? He actually said, I just figured one of the reasons God gave me a bonus this year is so I can be a blessing to somebody else who I don't even know. Understand, guys, that ain't natural. <laughs> that ain't normal. That is supernatural. That is Holy Spirit inspired. I mean, we just be honest about, I'll be honest about me. When most of us get a little extra, here's what we assume. Oh, for me. <laughs> now I can go to, you know, whatever, you know, Turks and Caicos or whatever your thing is or go to Pottery Barn and buy a sofa or whatever your, your deal is. <laughs> But a spirit of generosity asks a different question. It's like, wow, God, thanks. Thanks for blessing me. You must really trust me. You must want to bless a lot of people through me. So whatever you give, however you give, this is your business, cash, check, just give with joy as Jesus gave to you. And I want to end by just thanking those of you who actually already gave online because one of the most amazing things about our church is that half our people give electronically every week. In other words, that's what Colleen and I do. You go to liquidchurch.com, give, and uh, we just make it a recurring gift. Like, we don't even want to see our paycheck. We just want 10% we want to give to God. And I just want to give you huge thanks for those of you who do that because that's a mark of spiritual maturity. In other words, you're saying every time, I don't even want to forget, I just want to automatically always give back to God first. And that's a huge blessing to our ministry. In fact, here's what I want you to know. Your giving this week is going to go far beyond paying school lunch debt. Part of your offering is going to go help feed the homeless on the streets of Newark and Patterson. It's going to bring clean water to Busasamana, Rwanda. And it's going to help pay for packing one million meals this December for the global poor. So it is your weekly tithes and offerings that allow our church to go beyond our cities and serve the world for Jesus Christ. So thank you for your global generosity, amen? amen? All right, if you're ready to do this, we're gonna give cheerfully, so let out a cheer. Three, two, one. You ready? Let's do it. <laughs> all right, I wanna call our ushers forward at all of our campuses, let's do this. Come on down, guys, with our, our popcorn buckets. Would you just stand there at the front aisles? I just wanna pray for us before we receive today's offerings. Father, we're, you've opened our eyes to your word. And Father, we've seen you've opened your hands to the world by giving Jesus Christ, your son. And Father, you canceled our debt of sin. It is paid for. It is gone. Praise you, God. You have given us, Lord, our sins forgiven. You've given us a purpose for living. And you've guaranteed us a home in heaven. And so, Father, open our hearts now as we give. I pray, would you just flood your people with a sense of the joy of the Holy Spirit, God. Lord, do more than we ask or imagine. I pray that you will take these gifts, Lord, and as we send 100% out of the walls of this church, it would multiply in your hands. Father, we want to harvest 10, 50, 100, 1,000 times, Father, what we could do in our own strength. I pray that all of the fruit of this would be laid at your feet, that all the glory would go to Jesus' name as we serve our city and saturate it with your love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone said together, amen. amen.